Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. I'm so tired of being tired. Ugh. Okay. We're getting back into history on this channel. Don't get me wrong, I, I love reacting to all the other stuff, I really do, it's just... I started on history on this channel, and ever since, the algorithm just kind of steers you into what gets a lot of views and what make what makes you more money and i'd like to get back into history i really would like as like more so than i have been in the past month or so so my name's connor hello i'm ready to learn i want to clear up the 1700s they are that sort of gap that it's a sort of gap century in between the napoleonic wars and the 30 years war that I'm trying to fill up on Europe. And uh, this is a good place to start. My name's Connor. Hello. I like to learn things. Let's do it. Preemptive like. Original link to the video, top of the description. Link to the Discord, uh, top of the description as well. Awesome channel. Let's go. The Great Northern War marks the culmination of the tumultuous past couple of centuries in Northern Europe. This war not only changed the balance of power in the region, but on the continent as a whole. At the end of the conflict, one of Europe's newest and most militarized powers lay in ruins, and from its ashes, an empire previously on the fringe of European affairs would start its explosive rise. In this episode, we will talk about the events that led to the beginning of the Great Northern War and cover the Battle of Nava, one of the most interesting engagements of the era. Speaking of interesting, the sponsor of this video, Gemstone Legends, is one of the coolest Make sure to use their link in the description, guys. It helps out the channel. New puzzle RPG games in 2021. With great workmanship, this beautiful game is available for free on iOS and Android. Good. According to one of our team members who's been playing the game for months, it's perfect for a commute or when you're trying to wind down after a long day. His in-game nickname is Phoenix Red. Gemstone Legends is a great blend of RPG and puzzles, with epic heroes fighting evil using match 3 fighting techniques. Each hero has special skills, a unique battle role, and dragons to support them. The heroes are custom made with unique animations and their drawings are exquisite. Gemstone Legends offers much more than that, with a fun PvP system, dozens of characters, skills and artifacts. The single player campaign is not linear, and the Hex campaign map allows your heroes to go where you decide. Gemstone Legends has countless artifacts with different stats, all geared towards allowing you to create a team of heroes tailored to your game's style. I'm ready. Download the game, as this helps our channel. Making these videos without sponsors would be very difficult. Use our exclusive link in the description and pinned comment, or scan our QR code to download the game. New players will get a super bonus worth $50 after the tutorial. Come on! Phoenix Red will be waiting for you in the game. There we go. Ooh. I like this map. Safavid. Ottomans. Polish-Lithuanians. Russia. Iberian Union. Oh, the Ottoman Empire has... Uh, Papal States. Uh, Naples. Venice. Genoa. Genoa. The Habsburgs. Okay. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the Spanish succession, uh, is happening, right? The ascension of Gustavus Adolphus to the throne of Sweden in 1611 is generally regarded as the starting point of the Swedish Empire. The able young king inherited a multitude of conflicts in the region, most notably the Ingrian War against the Tsardom of Russia. The war was concluded with the Peace of Stolbovo in 1618, which stipulated that Sweden would gain Ingria and parts of Karelia, thereby denying Russia access to the Baltic Sea. Russia, which was still recovering from the time of troubles, was unable to offer any significant resistance to Swedish expansion. The war with Poland-Lithuania, which had been sporadically raging on since 1600, was concluded in 1629. Gustavus Adolphus was not able to force Sigismund III of Poland to renounce his claims on the Swedish throne, 
but he was able to keep most of Livonia, including the important port city of Riga, and gain valuable trade concessions. In Guys, I have a weird, convoluted, maybe stupid question, but I, I gotta ask it so I get it out of my mind and I can pay attention. So, you know how Russia became the, com the communist country, you know, Lenin went over there. Prior to that, so you had Tsar Nicholas, was there always that kind of underlying separation between the Russian pub? I, 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 never mind. I, I just one of the most destructive conflicts in I don't history, know how to word it. The Thirty Years' War had started as well. Although the last phases of the Swedish Polish War are considered to be a part of the Thirty Years' War, the Kingdom of Sweden did not involve itself directly in the war before the King of Denmark, the former champion of Protestantism, had been defeated. Worried about Catholic domination in the empire, Gustavus Adolphus, who was a leader of a Protestant nation himself, intervened on the Protestant side. Although the Catholics were close to a complete victory, the Swedish involvement changed the tides of the war. Sweden's superior army dominated the battlefield even after the death of Gustavus, and by six. Was there always an underlying hatred of the Russian Tsars prior to the killing in the Russian Revolution? Is my question. 1848 dominated the battlefield even after the death of Gustavus, and by 1648 the war was grinding down to a stalemate. Large parts of Europe, especially the Holy Roman Empire, were left decimated demographically, economically, and militarily. In contrast, the Kingdom of Sweden, by acquiring territories in Pomerania and Bremen Verden at the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, became the preeminent power in the Baltic region and one of Europe's leading states. Sweden may have been the dominant power in Northern and Eastern Europe. However, its supremacy in the Baltic was incomplete. Only several years after the Peace of Westphalia, they went to war against Poland in what became known as the Deluge. Even though the Swedes were dominating for most of the war, by the end, the coalition assembled against them proved to be too difficult to deal with and peace was signed. The peace was a merely symbolic victory for Sweden, as the Polish monarchs finally abandoned their claim to the Swedish throne. Moreover, it also proved that the Kingdom of Sweden could not survive for too long against an organized coalition of enemies. Charles XI ascended to the throne of Sweden in 1660, and the majority of his rule was peaceful, barring the relatively short Scanian War of 1675-1679. During the war, Sweden conquered Scania from Denmark, but lost some of its lands in Germany, mostly due to the inefficiency of the army. After the war, Charles XI revitalized the economy and administration of Sweden, However, his most notable reforms were of a military nature. Those reforms aimed to make the Swedish army one of the best in Europe. Charles XI's death in 1697 left his only son, Charles XII, as the new Swedish king. As Charles XII was barely 15 at the time, Peter I of Russia and Christian V of Denmark saw this as an ideal opportunity to exploit Sweden's apparent weakness. On the 21st of April 1699, Russia and Denmark concluded a treaty of mutual assistance in future wars against Sweden. One of the secret articles of the treaty, however, stipulated that Russia would only join the war after it made peace with the Ottoman Empire. Shortly afterwards, Peter concluded a treaty with Augustus of Saxony, who was also the elected ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Augustus was- So you can see where the, the Polish-Lithuanian, the Sardom of Russia and the Ottoman Empire kind of meet. That's where the, uh, the Cossacks are, right? Was also the elected ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Augustus was a very proud and extravagant ruler, and his main goal was to return Livonia to the Commonwealth. Livonia, although a land that brought insurmountable wealth to the Swedish crown, was also a source of great concern. After Sweden had gained Livonia in 1629 through the Treaty of Altmark, 
It Why exactly? Why exactly did Livonia bring so much money? After Sweden had gained Livonia in 1629 through the Treaty of Altmark, it gave certain assurances to the old Livonian nobility that they would preserve the rights that they had had under the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and that they would not lose any of the lands that were in their possession. For the first couple of decades, the relationship between the Swedish monarchs and the Livonian nobility was amicable. Charles X, however, was not as lenient as his predecessors, and by 1655, he intended to revoke a quarter of the lands that belonged to the Livonian nobility, only with the Second Northern War preventing him from doing so. Charles XI would turn his father's plans into a reality after ascending to the throne, and by the time of his death in 1697, the Livonian nobility held only a fifth of the original number of estates. One of the nobles, Johann Reinhold Patkel, outraged by the Great Reduction, agitated the Livonian nobility to rise up against Sweden in rebellion. He was swiftly arrested and sentenced to death, and to avoid execution, Patkel fled from Sweden. Patkel later... Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead if you want. ...the original number of estates. One of the nobles, Johann Reinhold Patkel, outraged by the Great Reduction, agitated the Livonian nobility to rise up against Sweden in rebellion. He was swiftly arrested and sentenced to death, and to avoid execution, Patkel fled from Sweden. Patkel later played a key role in the formation of the anti-Swedish coalition, as he was usually the diplomatic link between Peter, Augustus and Christian, and provided intelligence on the Swedish defences in the Baltic. Sensing the impending danger, Charles XII sent diplomats to Russia in the summer of 1699, with the goal of confirming a peace treaty between the two states from 1661. A skillful diplomat, Peter the Great assured the envoys of his peaceful intentions, but in reality, he had already decided to go to war. Augustus II also sent a diplomatic envoy to Sweden, assuring the king of his friendly intentions and asking for Swedish mediation in a dispute between himself and Prussia. I, I While understand. all of these dialogues took place, the coalition continued its preparations for war. Ultimately, the Duke of Holstein Gottorp became alarmed by the Danish naval buildup and informed his ally Gottorp. Guys, sorry, but look at how, ma how many lakes are in this part of Russia and Finland. Like, just lake, 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 like, it's just speckled, sorry. ...continued its preparations for war. Ultimately, the Duke of Holstein Gottorp became alarmed by the Danish naval buildup and informed his ally Charles XII of what had been transpiring. Though both the Swedes and Holstein had tried to resolve the matter peacefully, the new King of Denmark, Frederick IV, refused to negotiate. The first act of war was committed by Frederick's troops in March of 1700, when the Danish army entered lands belonging to the Duke of Holstein, and shortly afterwards laid siege to Turning. Guys, I don't know what it is about this, the year 1700. It's kind of like how the year 900 is on me, and it just seems like my mind views 1700 as not that long ago but views 1699 as a long time ago, even though, like, the 1700s, they seem somewhat recent. And then when I think of 1600, even though it's, it's obvi obviously just the preceding century, it just, it seems so much further back. And so I'd like to, uh, learn, obviously, sure up my knowledge in, in this time period and in Europe to, um, change that so that my mind doesn't think that way. Simultaneously, on the other side of the Baltic Sea, Saxon forces under Augustus entered Livonia and captured the port of Dunamunda. Charles XII, together with his war council, seeing the Danish threat as more immediate, decided to strike at them first. You know when that music Great goes, Britain and the Netherlands about to go down. were uneasy at the prospect of a destructive war in the Baltic as they had trade interests in the region. Fearing that the conflict might destabilize their economies, the maritime powers deployed their fleets to Urusund to ensure that no lasting harm to trade and their merchants would be done. By August, a Swedish force of 16,000 had assembled in Scania. 
though attacking the main Danish army and lifting the Siege of Turning seemed like the most secure way to deal a decisive defeat to Frederick IV. Charles opted for the riskier option of attacking the Danish mainland itself. The Swedish fleet, with Charles himself and his troops on board, managed to out- Uh, Mal 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 Copenhagen? ...maneuver their more formidable Danish counterpart and make contact with the British and Dutch fleet. The maritime powers were willing to assist the Swedish king, so the Danish fleet was forced to retreat to Copenhagen. Skillfully avoiding parts of the island where coastal batteries were present, Swedish troops subsequently disembarked on Zealand. The Danish mustered up around 700 men and 7 artillery pieces to attack the Swedish disembarking forces. However, they were no match for the 2,500 Swedish soldiers led by Charles himself. It was here that Charles XII saw battle for the first time and proved himself an excellent leader, being the first one to jump into the water and lead the assault. The Danish were caught completely by surprise with this move and were starting to panic as the Swedish army was within a stone's throw of their capital. A few days after Charles set foot on Zealand, more Swedish soldiers landed there as well and preparations were made for the march on Copenhagen. Meanwhile, the Swedish, Dutch and British fleets blockaded and started bombarding Copenhagen from the sea. With Copenhagen surrounded on both land and sea, Frederick IV of Denmark made peace with the Duke of Holstein Gottorp and peace with Sweden was achieved soon afterwards as well. On the 18th of August 1700, the same day that peace was made between Denmark and Sweden, Peter I of Russia declared war on Sweden and began his offensive into Ingria. Okay, there's Narva. The first target of Peter the Great's campaign was Narva, a crucial fort near the Baltic Sea. Peter besieged Narva with an army more than 30,000 strong and with more than 150 cannons. Such an artillery force would have reduced Narva to rubble were it not for the fact that the Russians suffered from a lack of ammunition due to bad roads. With trouble brewing in the west, in what would become the War of the Spanish Succession, the fleet of the maritime powers transported the Swedish army back to the mainland before- Hey, Kalmar, the Kalmar Union? The fleet of the maritime powers transported the Swedish army back to the mainland before setting sail westwards. As the Swedish army was fully united, Charles was able to set sail for Livonia. Though Dinamunda fell to Saxon forces quickly and with little resistance, Patkul gravely misjudged the loyalty and intentions of the Livonian nobility. He had expected the Livonian nobility to join Augustus and Riga to fall quickly too. However, Livonian support was minimal and Saxon forces alone were not strong enough to take the city. Learning of the Danish defeat, Augustus II retreated across the Duna River in hope that Charles would agree to a ceasefire. Charles arrived with a part of his army in Pernau in autumn. As Augustus retreated beyond the Duna River for winter quarters, Charles decided to head towards Narva and the Russian army. The rest of the Swedish War Council, along with foreign emissaries, tried to persuade Charles to postpone the attack on the Russian army until after the winter had passed and the army was united. Charles, however, but... wished nothing other than to meet his enemy in open battle, and not even the knowledge of the size of the Russian army could dissuade him. While marching towards Narva on the 7th of November, a part of the Swedish army clashed with a Russian raiding party under the command of Boris Sheremetev at Yervi. Although the Russian raiding party suffered relatively heavy casualties compared to the Swedish ones, General Sheremetev became aware of how far the Swedish army was from Narva. On the 18th of November, Charles XII arrived with his army at the village of Lagena, about 8 kilometers away from Narva. I just want to say, I say it all the time, this channel is such a brilliant storyteller. It zooms out, it starts zoomed out, it gives you the basics, and, and as it goes in, the music builds up and it zooms in further and further and further, and then the namesake of the video, the battle, starts. Seeing that many of the horses were ill and that there was heavy snowfall, he knew he needed to act quickly. 
As soon as he was certain that Narva had not fallen and that his men were ready, Charles left Lagena. Meanwhile, the Russians, being aware that the Swedish army was on its way, began defensive preparations. Trenches were dug around the Narva River's meander, and wooden stakes were placed in the center on the Goldenhof Hill. There were two rows of ramparts running alongside the trench as well, and between them there were soldiers' barracks. Several artillery batteries were placed along the trenches, although they would not have any effect on the battle, as the Russian army ran out of ammunition several weeks before. Sources differ when it comes to the exact size of the Russian army, but modern estimates agree that they had between 35,000 and 40,000 men at their disposal, with the overwhelming majority being infantry. The Russian forces were stretched for over six kilometers on their side of the trenches. I just want to pee quick, guys. I'll be right back just before it starts. Okay, I'm good. Russian forces were stretched for over six kilometers on their side of the trenches. The Russian army was under the general command of Peter I and Field Marshal Fyodor Golovin. The right wing of the Russian forces were commanded by General Avtonom Golovin, the center by Ivan Trebutskoy, and the left by Adam Vierde. The Russian cavalry, placed on the far side of their left wing, near the bank of the Narva River, was commanded by Boris Jeremietev. The Swedes had around 9,000 men, out of which 5,500 were grenadiers, 3,500 dragoon cavalry, and 37 cannons. The army was split into two relatively equal parts. The right wing contained 3,000 grenadiers and was commanded by Otto. What does a dra dragoon mean? Again, I I've heard that before. The right wing contained 3,000 grenadiers and was commanded by Otto Welling, a veteran of the Scanian War. It was divided into three columns, with the one in the center being smaller and being hollow in the middle. The left wing was divided into two groups, with one being commanded by Field Marshal Karl Gustav Rienschold and the other by Magnus Stjernbock. Rienschold had around 1,500 infantry, divided into two columns, while Stjernbock had 1,000 infantrymen under his command. The Swedish cavalry was positioned on the flanks, mostly in order to guard the infantry against Russian flanking maneuvers. Charles XII himself led the cavalry on the left flank. The Swedish artillery corps, under the command of Johann Hublad, had 16 artillery pieces placed in between the left and right wing of the army, and 21 were positioned on the left wing. Moving his army through the forest and barely passable trails, Charles reached the outskirts of Narva and positioned himself on Germansburg Hill. After performing reconnaissance of the Russian defenses, at 10 a.m. on the 19th, Charles positioned his army in preparation for battle. He was hoping to meet Peter on the battlefield. However, the Tsar had left Narva the day before the battle, taking Fyodor Golovin with him. The command of the army was passed to Charles Eugene de Croix, a Saxon diplomatic envoy to Peter. De Croix, aware of his lack of military skill, was initially unwilling to take command of the army. However, it is said that Peter convinced him over a glass of wine. Afternoon Golovin, Vieda, and Trebetskoy were just as inexperienced as de Croix was. The most capable Russian commander at Narva was Boris Cheremietev, although he was passed over for holding a lower rank than the others. The Russian commanders, even though fielding a superior force, were unwilling to commit to open battle, fearing that the Swedish army that they were seeing was merely the vanguard of a much greater unit. The battle commenced when Charles ordered his soldiers to fire two volleys at their enemies and advance towards the trenches. At 2 p.m., the weather changed. A heavy snowstorm and hailstorm started, and the wind was blowing directly in the face of the Russian soldiers. Using the snowstorm as a screen, Charles ordered his men to fill up the trenches with fascines and start directly assaulting the Russian position. That's terrifying. Just imagining a bunch of Swedes just like poking out of the, the whiteness. In less than 15 minutes, the Swedish infantry filled up the trenches enough for their cavalry to pass. The Russian soldiers did not see the Swedes until they were right in front of them. Like ghosts. 
the infantry under the command of Rienschild quickly captured the artillery batteries in the center, while the infantry under Stienbock directly assaulted the Russian army. Due to the number of barracks and the bad positioning of the Russian ramparts, the Russian troops did not have much room to maneuver, and brutal close quarters combat ensued, where the Swedish soldiers had the clear upper hand. Due to the relentless Swedish assault and the surprise of the attack, the majority of the Russian right flank descended into complete disarray. A large number of the soldiers fled towards the bridge to the north. Few managed to escape though, as the bridge collapsed under their weight, taking many men with it to the bottom of the river. Many of the Russian soldiers tried swimming across the ice-cold river as well, with almost all drowning in the process. The soldiers who were left in the trenches also started to flee, only to be forced back by Charles' dragoons. The only part of the Russian right which still posed some organized resistance were the elite Priobreshensky and Simeonovsky guards. They I mean, even if you made it across the river, I'm not sure you last very long with, uh, before freezing to death. ...created a wagon fort on the far side of the Russian right wing, near the Nava River. Continuous assaults against the wagon fort did not yield any results, and the Swedish army suffered heavy casualties. In the meantime, the Swedish right wing saw as much success as the left. The Russian forces were quickly routed, and part of the Swedish right was able to join the left wing shortly afterwards. Sheremetev, seeing that the cavalry would be useless in this type of close quarters combat, fled southwards. De Croix, also aware of how dire the situation was, decided to surrender to Charles. As night began to fall, the battle became even more fierce and bloody. Charles drew up many of his footmen in between the city and the entrenchments so that he could not be surprised from any side. Wishing to cut the lines of communication between what was left of the Russian army's wings, Charles ordered Hublot to capture the artillery battery on Goldenhof Hill. By morning, General Golovin surrendered as well. His troops were allowed to keep their arms, as Charles admired the bravery of the two elite guards. General Vieda, learning of the surrender of the right wing, subsequently surrendered the left wing. After receiving the arms and standards of the left wing, Charles allowed the rest of the Russian army to leave over the bridge, which his forces had already repaired. The battle was a catastrophe for the Russians. Look, I know history is history, and, and I shouldn't really be like, oh, that, that wasn't as exciting. It just, it seemed like it was over from the start, and it seemed like the Russians were far outmatched and out, outgunned and out willingness to fight -ness, you know what I mean? And so I, I really sort of look at history like many people would a TV show, and so because I, I don't know so much about it, it it's entertaining to me. And I, I like it when two more ready armies go at it. You know, one that pops out to me a lot is is there was a battle between Caesar and Pompey in, um, I think, in Greece modern-day Greece. Anyway, there, there, there have been loads of examples with many different, but it really seems like the Russians were not um, up to par. As their casualties amounted up to 10,000 men, with de Croix and most of the other commanders ending up as prisoners, the Swedish army, on the other hand, lost less than 1,500 men. To make matters worse for the Russians, the Swedes had captured 143 cannons and 28 mortars, almost the entire amount of artillery that Peter the Great had at his disposal, as well as the entire Russian baggage train. The Battle of Nava confirmed two things to Europe, that the Swedish army was one of the best, and that the Russian army was as ineffective as it was large. Charles XII, merely 18 years of age, proved that he was a more than capable military commander who, backed by an army of as great quality as the Swedish one, could overcome the insurmountable odds that were stacked against him. It seems like it was a game of rock, paper, scissors, and right from the beginning, you knew it was like scissors against paper, paper against rock, or rock against scissors, whatever you want to use. With the victory at Nava, a complete Swedish victory in the war seemed like a distinct possibility. 
On the other hand, knowing that his army was merely beginning to reform, Peter the Great was not disheartened, and he famously remarked, they have beaten us, they might beat us again, but in time they will teach us how to beat them. Pretty wise. Okay, I, I, I like that self-awareness. Um, Our series on the Great Northern War will continue soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. Awesome video as always. Battle of... of... Clis... Clisau. Alright, I can do that next. Cool. Awesome video. Forgot I was so big up here. Jeez. Again. Hope you're all doing well. Getting back into history. See you next time.